Welcome to this installment of the Bankhead Visiting Writers Series made possible by an endowment from the Bankhead Foundation, the Program in Creative Writing, the Department of English, and the College of Arts and Sciences. Thanks to Leah and Bob Wealth and the Book Arts Program for the lovely broadsides commemorating this evening's reading. And thanks as well to John McCall of the Soup Store for making the readers' books available for purchase in the lobby. The next reading will be by the poet Charles Simic on Thursday, March 18th in the Rast B Room of the Bryant Conference Center at 7.30 p.m. Following tonight's reading, there will be a reception at the home of Betsy Hogan. Maps are available on the podium, and as always, please bring your own beverage. If you would like to receive email reminders of upcoming readings, please add your name and email address to the list in the book table. Mary Gateskill's writing is like a conversation, a tight and toying seduction, writhing with rhyme of exchange, penetrating moments of awareness and, inc and incision, self-reflected in her prose, as conversations both vibrant and static at once, like a suspension, suspension bridge, humming with hidden electrical energy. The suppressed languor of a person moving underwater, negotiating the snarl of emotional currents that vied and buzzed against each other like agitated snakes. His compassion tickled like a blade of glass drawn across her wrist. Their halting conversation, rising to fill whole strings of words with mysterious feeling and then subsiding to a barely felt pulse. The language in Mary Gates' Steel stories is layered with emotional complexity, lasting images of metaphorical precision, resonating sounds of dark humor. Her characters, gloating and condescending, linger and lapse through self-conscious awareness and intrepid desires, analytically painted through pulses of pain and pleasure as she moves through them, so, as she moves them through social and sexual worlds and their search for intimacy. Mary Gateskill has written two collections of short stories, Bad Behavior and Because They Wanted To, and a novel, Two Girls Fat and Thin. Her fiction and journalism have appeared in The New Yorker, Mirabella, Esquire, Harper's, and Vogue. It is a great pleasure tonight to welcome Mary Gateskill. Thanks. I just changed my mind about what I was going to read tonight, so I hope all the pages are here. Um, I guess I have to change my mind again if they're not. This is a section from a novel in progress, so I hope you'll forgive there's awkwardness in it. Winter in the city is a big, irritated white man walking down the street at twilight with gray trash blowing around him. He is constricted against the cold, and even though he is walking energetically, he is secretly turned inward. Deep in his chest, behind the bones and under the muscle, he is protecting a small, hot seed. Inside the seed are thousands of fiery colored strands, and when it bursts apart, they will pour out in all directions. There will be spring. Spring is a handsome black bike messenger with dazzling almond eyes, hammering down the streets to deliver his packages like he's a pinball in a machine, hitting everything exactly right, dropping back down the slot and firing out again. He has the seed now and he doesn't even know it. He tosses it quick and casual from hand to hand, his head full of light and movement. Light and movement keep pouring from the seed, the strands growing bigger and broader, unfurling until each brilliant burst finds a shape that suits it. The shapes don't hold, of course. The unfurling keeps going, but very slow and torpid now, as big blonde summer moves down the street in early evening, her abdomen protruding a bit in her tight dress, and the thick red skin of her heels hanging just over the rims of her sandals the little fleshy nubs of her painted toes poking out the front. You stand in line at the post office, smelling the other people in line and sensing that the shapes of things are bleeding slightly in the heat. But this season was an empty pocket stuck between winter and spring. That's how it seemed to Bettina Long when she stuck her hand out the window into the air shaft to see what the weather was like. It was not something that would take a human form. It was tingling emptiness, 
tense and stretched open, waiting for something to come into it. Or maybe waiting for something to go out of it. Emptiness goes two ways. Once Bettina said to a therapist, my life is empty. And the woman has answered, the woman had answered, that is true, you are lucky. Emptiness is very beautiful. At the time, Bettina had wanted to slap the bitch. But right now she liked this tingling, stretched open feeling. Bettina closed the window and got out of bed. She went to the closet and took out her scale. She took off her pajamas and stepped naked onto the scale. Good. She was one quarter pound less than she had been the day before. She found the bald black socks she had taken off the night before, raised one to her nose, sniffed it absently, then put them on. Now for coffee, cottage cheese, a piece of fruit. Heavy and stiff, her old cat plodded into the kitchen with her. Its fur was rucked and dirty looking in the light, like if you hit it, a cloud of dust would fly off it. Bettina stroked its shoulders and brittle spine, and it gazed at her with deep eyes. She poured dry morsels into its dish, and it crouched before the meal with a soft, satisfied squat. It blinked with pleasure as it ate the same dry thing it ate every day. Bettina sat at the table and ate her cottage cheese straight out of the carton with the cut-up apple on the side. She drank her coffee out of a green mug and enjoyed the blend of tastes, tart sweetness, bitterness, creamy blandness with salt. The coffee pot with its cunning shape, the heavy fruit bowl, the dutiful old appliances, the subtle humming sounds that you can't hear if there's too much going on, like blood in the body. The bale of dust with little sparkles in it, showing you that the air is always moving. It was a nice idea, describing the weather as people, old-fashioned and strange. Bettina was a literary editor of a small but visible weekly newspaper that covered the arts intensively, and she had seen this description on her computer the previous day at work. It had appeared in the middle of a website for a girl pop star, a site to which Bettina had come in order to fact check a review concerning the cultural presence of the pop star. She'd wondered what it was doing there, but as she was working against a deadline, she got what she needed and turned her attention back to the review. The description had piqued her curiosity, and she went back to the site at the end of the day to find that it was no longer there. She searched for it, then got involved in reading the pop star's account of her friendship, which she absolutely denied was more than a friendship, with a thug who had recently shot a rival thug. She said that he was struggling with inner demons. She said that she was praying for him. Bettina thought, I'm sick of this shit the woman, the man. She finished her coffee, went back into the bedroom and took her exercise mat out of the closet. She put on her sneakers and with a mild grunt began to stretch. On the other hand, she could see why people liked it. She pictured the pop star and the thug performing before an audience that stretched into infinity. The pop singer knelt and prayed her prayer a pure distillation of a thousand songs, pleading with a straying man to return to the love and safety of a woman's arms. The thug resisted. He scowled, not at the singer, but at invisible forces that she could not understand, forces inside him that made him want to kill. His scowl was profound. It was fat and articulate as a thousand-page book. It made you see how important the forces inside him were and why he wanted to listen to them. The audience, faceless and endless, sat enwrapped. It used to be that when she would have these images of men and women in static positions acting out traditional roles, she would feel an excited surge inside, a feeling that she must rise up and expose them as false. Now every time she rose up, she felt like something coming out of a cuckoo clock. She would do it because it had to be done, but there was no more excitement in it. Or maybe there was too much defeat in it. 
A while ago, rising up to expose sexism was like being on a game show. Lights, bells going off, applause, the congenial host goading you on. Sure, some people fought you, especially in the beginning, but that only made it more exciting. Back then, how quickly women would signal to each other that they were on the feminist side, how quickly it would come up in conversation. Girls would wear patches sewn on their jeans, the round woman symbol shaped like a mirror, except with a fist inside it. Suddenly, it wasn't okay to tell rape jokes anymore. Women's sexuality wasn't dirty anymore. You could choose to be a single woman with a career instead of an indentured cow like your mother. There were late night talks with earnest boys about the, fool, about the foolishness of the mother whore dichotomy, how it hurt men too, and then great sex afterwards. <laughs> then you could meet as intellectual equals and take it in the ass later if that pleased you, <laughs> or argue that ass fucking was sexist if it didn't. There were groundbreaking articles on sexual politics, rape, harassment, porn, prostitution. There was the triumphant emergence of all that had been covered in shame. Homosexuality, obesity, and sadomasochism. It all came out and strutted down the sidewalk with a stake between its legs. In 10 years time, girls were forming rock bands and, sp and playing topless with slut spray painted across their boobs. When Bettina had edited an anthology of explicit memoirs about transgressive sexuality, including a piece of her own about an SM fling, she felt like she was performing an act of emotional heroism. Vigorously, she twisted right to left, exercising her waist. Her old comforter, a rumpled face at the bottom of her bed, frowned at her with its indent eyes and mouth. Now it was different. Nobody wanted to hear it anymore. Now glamorous actresses hung out at the Playboy Mansion, grinning for the camera. The ancient Hugh Hefner rampaged through society with a team of blonde broads, asses hanging out their mini dresses, humping each other in a drunken conga line at the fancy disco. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there were articles with titles like Surrender to Marriage, raving about the heroism of marriage. Surveys proved that married women had the best sex lives of all, that single women were actually non-orgasmic. Suddenly, everybody wanted to have a baby. Everybody. Babies were firing out of cunts nonstop. <laughs> and there were articles, books, anthologies, internet sites, and movies about how it was the most profound, most exalted, most character-building, creative, adventurous, mysterious, bravest, noblest, super sexiest thing ever. Now, it didn't matter what else you did. If you didn't have a baby, it wasn't worth shit. Looking at my wife and newborn child, wrote a new father for a prestigious magazine. I realized that procreation is what the universe wants, and it's what my wife and I are doing. <laughs> The universe wants a lot of things, thought Bettina. It wants cancer. It wants famine and war and rape and constant shitting and pissing. It wants eating and sleeping and orgasms for no reason. It wants drunken fights and scorpions and rattlesnakes and black widows and Gila monsters. It wants victims. It wants loud music. It wants masturbating. It wants queers, lots of queers. It wants art. By now she was on her elbows and knees with one leg raised and bent, pulsing towards the ceiling, working her ass. So much collective effort put towards tightening and raising the ass. Women were all over the world on their elbows and knees, concentrating on their ass muscles. <laughs> Such a weird feeling. That contraction, more tight, more in, squeeze it, burn it. Like being trapped in a box that was getting smaller and smaller. Well, the universe must want that too. When she went outside, she didn't see anybody and she thought, this season is an empty block with no one on it. Then a middle-aged woman wearing a green coat covered with lint rounded the corner walking a happy, bristling little dog. 
Piano music in a dark key tumbled from someone's window like a rolling cloud of marbles. She passed a beggar she saw every day standing in front of a hospital. Somebody dropped a coin in his cup and he yelled, thanks, I'm saving up for a lobotomy. She stopped at a newsstand and scanned the magazines. Big lips and bright eyes gleamed from a hundred colorful covers. So many signals in each face. The shades of sorrow hidden in a model's left eye. The pungent, ugly cruelty in the corner of another's mouth. The hints of something trapped, glimpsing at you from behind the magazine's grid of symbol faces, live and moving, and giving the symbols extra charge. A blurb said, what does he think of your orgasm face? and urgent pictures leapt up. Orgasm, a wet red muscle with thumping valves and dark little pits you can't see into. The girl, the ordinary reader, tingling with excitement and fear as she looks on it. The girl, now looking away from it, thinking with one finger against her sweet cheek, wondering what she looks like to the boy. Then the boy holding himself up on his elbows to check out his girlfriend's squalling face astonished that all that wet nether pounding and grabbing has exploded so spectacular out her mouth. Then the boy with other boys, nervously tossing a lock of his hair as he jokes about the wet red thing, his ardor and his unease shimmering under the joke, shimmering right through to the words on the cover of the magazine. Wonderful, the bits of feeling and personality rising and dissolving under the format of pictures and information about products and actresses. For example, the thug and the pop star on the cover of People for the second time this year. The beggar holds out his emptiness. The magazines scream out their fullness. Bettina reached for the daily news. How's your grandson, she asked the Korean man behind the counter. Good, he starts school in the fall, good school. The man gave her a smart, almost martial nod. He tossed a quarter in the air, caught it, and slapped it down on the back of his other hand like they were playing heads or tails. Tails. He smiled at her and nodded again. Bettina entered the subway station and, signaling with her fingers, bought tokens from an old woman in a bulletproof box. She descended the stairs to a system of concrete tunnels. In the tunnel opposite her, an express train was roaring downtown. Seated people swayed crazily in their seats. The lights in the cars flickered on and off, and then the train was gone. The crackling of the sound system subsided, and the buzz of the rails emerged. All day long, speed and electricity ran back and forth inside density and mass, while people walked in and down, up and out. A man with big black tattoos and abstract shapes walked past her. He had a large, intelligent head and the demeanor of a kind, thoughtful dog. A large, a square-shaped medieval angel was tumbling down his arm and falling off his shoulder. Her train roared in, and she got on it. Distorted voices announced the next stop. The doors rattled shut, and the train shot off, hammering and knocking. Bettina sat down and opened the paper. There was the mayor cavorting in a skirt mocking the president during a special evening of skits. There was the trial of a man who'd flirted with a teenager for months on the internet, lured her into his apartment, and strangled her. There was a little girl saved by a gang member during a shootout. The forest fire in New Mexico was on the front page again. It had been burning for weeks, killing everything. Bettina thought of animals burning to death, paws flailing, jaws trying to bite, the body swallowed by flame. Horror opened inside her, and her mind traveled furiously, trying to outrun it. Of course she knew babies. Of course she knew having babies was a good thing. She'd even admit that some feminists had been stupidly cavalier on the subject, belittling housewives and acting like careers were better, strutting off with their briefcases, while dumpy mom stood in the doorway with children hanging off her, looking puffy and puzzled. All that soft strength, that beauty, that plant-like intelligence, so wrongfully effaced. Maybe it was right to elevate it now. 
maybe even right to belittle the arrogant feminist, acting like she didn't need what everybody else needed. Bettina could picture the feminist a sprawl on the floor with her mouth yawping in defeat and triumphant mom over her with a foot planted on her butt, the kids cheering, and she could say, well, all right. She liked kids. She respected mothers. Her sister Maria had just become a mother of adorable twin girls and Bettina loved it. She had sent clothes, toys, huge boxes of diapers. She went out to visit Jana and Pippi every week. Maria and her husband Will lived in an Ecuadorian neighborhood in Queens in a fecund chaos of an apartment. Baby clothes, bottles, dishes, spoons, forks, jars, towels, rattles, even radios and books got picked up by the tornado of baby chaos. You grabbed what you needed as it whirled past and two seconds later you needed something else. But it was true what the stinking magazine said. The tornado was roaring joy with all the other emotions spinning round it, too mixed up to tell rage from love. And Maria strode through it, commanding it, soothing it, organizing each roaring bit of it with her quick, potent hands. Of course it got disorganized as soon as she moved on, but it didn't matter. All that mattered was the roaring. Maria was rosy and rampant, and so was their mother, finally <coughs> grand presiding on the couch with Jana and Pippi in each arm, their tiny faces like sparkling vectors of personality, slowly taking form. Neighbors came by to pay tribute. A big homosexual named Fred with a fleshy chest and a benevolent forehead held sparkling new Jana on his old dull knee. Their mother cajoled Pippi to burp while the baby struggled to master the new life coming through her. A special heartbeat machine was plugged in so that the babies would feel safe. The room was filled with the subterranean thumping and sucking of a huge, unstoppable heart. Doesn't it make you want to have one, Fred asked Bettina. My work is my baby, she said, and it immediately sounded stupid, even to her. That's not the same at all, cried their mother. Work doesn't do this. She rubbed her nose on Pippi's tiny head. Pippi gravely furrowed her brow. Or this, she jogged the infant. Pippi smiled and gurgled. Or this, she lofted the flabbergasted baby into the air with both arms. Nothing is like this, but this. And she laughed this hideous girlish giggle. The train thumped from side to side pulling into the next station like it was furious. The doors rattled open. A black girl with a neat, beautiful head and huge lips walked in with headphones on her head. She was listening to a CD player with the music turned up full volume so everybody in the car could hear it. She moved almost as though she were dancing and she kept moving after she sat down. Her movements were supple and elegant, but she felt something huge hidden inside them something the girl expressed like little flicking waves express the ocean. The music, too. Through the headphones, it was thin and tinny, but you felt a whole world of music inside each thin strand of it. It seemed to come from the girl's body, like she was beating all the drums in her body, signaling to everyone while looking at no one. The signal could be about babies, but it could be about something else, something harder to explain. Don't forget this, said the girl. Don't forget. Bettina wanted to answer her. She wanted to sit with her legs open and beat out the rhythm on her thighs with both hands just to make the signal stronger, pass it along. But her hands felt heavy and tired, like they couldn't move fast enough. The signal was too weak inside her. Maybe the girl was describing a young woman's rhythm and Bettina, who was 47, was too old to carry it. Bettina glanced at a big old white woman sitting next to her. I'm more like her now, she thought. As Bettina watched, the woman took her glasses off and frowned at them. She pulled a crumpled piece of Kleenex from her pocket and rubbed the lenses. She didn't notice the girl across from her. She bent forward with a sigh, 
breathed on her glasses and rubbed them again. She put them back on. Maybe her body was all quiet inside. Or maybe the signal had gone somewhere else in her, somewhere too complicated to show on the subway. Because it wasn't just about having babies. It wasn't. Somebody like her mother couldn't understand that. Bettina glanced at the picture on the front page of the paper again, the aerial shot of the forest fire burning everything. The truth was, being with those babies for any length of time made her feel like screaming, screaming with boredom. You couldn't talk to them. You couldn't talk about anything but them. People said it was different if it was yours, and yes, if things had been different, she might have had a baby with Andrew. Might have. They were together for three years, and during that time, they'd never talked about it. Sex with Andrew was like going into a forest full of predators and enemies and fighting their way out together, <coughs> sometimes turning into enemies and having to fight each other, too, but always making it out okay. There was never any reason for it to be about anything else. But then it had come up just a few days before he died. He'd had cancer and he was in hospice care. They couldn't have sex, but he still liked to play with her body. The last time he asked her to take off her underwear and let him look, and she did. She climbed up on the hospital bed and sat in a strange crouch with her ankles together and knees open, underwear at ankles. He looked a long moment. His eyes were half closed and discolored with drugs. He couldn't quite close his mouth. He breathed in labored rasps and a deathly odor came from his lips. But still, he was looking. He smoothed her pubic hair with slow, clumsy strokes of his bony hand. He said, dear, so dear. Tears came into her eyes. She felt herself getting wet. She didn't care how he looked. He stopped moving his hand and just let it rest there. He was still looking between her legs when he said it. I'm sorry I never gave you a baby. The train pulled into Penn Station with a long screech. The girl moved her head from side to side in a quick, almost martial arc. Her body moved too, fierce and fluid, as if she had a snake of movement inside her and she was taking it this way and that, exercising it for pleasure and discipline. The people boarding the train looked at her and looked away. It amazed Bettina that no one stared. It was like they were saying, yeah, we already know about that. You think we don't know about that, you stuck-up girl? You have to put on a show in the subway? <coughs> Even the young man sitting a few, wait, a few feet away from her did not look. He sat splay-legged and sullen, deliberately staring in the opposite direction. His looking away from the girl seemed wrong, nearly disdainful, but there was sensitivity in his disdain. The sensitivity was firm and resilient, like a plant that needed to drink deep in the ground, the disdain like a fence around the plant. Andrew had died six years ago. When he was gone, Bettina was like an animal, bounding away from a predator. The only thing that mattered to her was getting away, running, stopping to gorge, running again. During that time, she met a young man at a party she had taken the initiative and brought him home. She had screwed him on the living room floor, and it was like running and gorging herself at the same time, and it was great. Afterwards, they'd lain together talking. Mostly she'd talked. She remembered her words leaping and frisking while the lit tip of his cigarette moved slowly back and forth in the dark. She thought he must really like her to listen to her like that. They saw each other for a few weeks, and then one night he didn't want to come upstairs with her. He said, you bulldoze me. You did it right from the beginning, and I'm sick of it. I don't want it anymore. She was too shocked to say anything. 
She felt small and ugly next to him in the dim streetlight. She struggled with how to explain herself to him. Then she looked up and saw his jaw set in an expression of nobility, like he'd eaten the nasty cookie, and now he was ready to renounce it and feel noble. That made her hate him. She looked at the boy across from her. She looked at the girl. She could still remember her old hate, but it was very far from her. It puzzled her, even embarrassed her a little. It still made her indignant that somebody saw her as a bulldozer going relentlessly forward when all she wanted to do was run away. But it wasn't fair to expect him to understand. When she got off at her stop, the girls with the drums inside her got off, too. On the platform, Bettina caught her eye and tried to smile at her, but the girl only gave her the blank, arrogant glance of a beautiful teenager. A voice from her headphones cried, you sexer. Last summer I was flipping through television channels and I came across a show in which the school bus's brakes had been rigged to fail while the bus hurtled down a hill. Also the bus was on fire and the emergency exit had been welded shut. <laughs> the announcer on the show probed his viewers with the question, now if you were on this bus, how would you escape? The show as it turned out was called Worst Case Scenario and the premise was that seemingly independent and highly unlikely events were put together and then played out. How would you escape from a burning house that was also being whisked away in a torrential flood? <laughs> <clears throat> but as I watched this show, I couldn't help but think I'd read all this before in a George Saunders story written some four years earlier. For in the story Sea Oak from the coll collection Pastoralia, the narrator and his sister Min and cousin Jade, having just buried their recently deceased Aunt Bernie, come home and watch this show, The Worst Thing That Could Happen, or as the narrator explains, a half hour of computer simulated tra simulations of tragedies that have never actually occurred, but theoretically could. A kid gets hit by a train and flies into a zoo where he's eaten by wolves. <laughs> a man cuts his hand off while chopping wood and while wandering around screaming for help is picked up by a tornado and dropped on a preschool during recess and lands on a pregnant teenager. <laughs> and this is part of the re experience in reading George Saunders. The future is here and now. It's bleak, it's absurd, it's grim, it's real, but it's funny. In a Saunders story, art no longer imitates life. Life imitates the art of George Saunders. Bizarre theme park-centered worlds filled with corporate morality and jargon mixed freely with the supernatural and the absurd. A plexiglass window can be installed into the side of a cow so children can see its digestive process in real time. A 400-pound man can squeeze his tyrannical boss to death, and bury him, and then claim he went to Mexico to clarify his relationship with God. Or a post-plague America can be filled with two separate classes of citizens, normal people, or those who are mutated, second class, and labeled flawed. It is little surprise then that with an imagination like this, George Saunders' work has found a strong following. He has published two collections of stories, Pastoralia and Civil War Land and Bad Decline, which was a finalist for the 1996 P. N. Hemingway Award and a New York Times notable book. He has also published a children's story, The Very Persistent Gappers of Fripp. His fiction has appeared in the New Yorker, Harper's, Story, Esquire, and many other publications. His stories have received two National Magazine Awards and have appeared three times in the Henry Awards collections. He teaches in the Creative Writing Program at the University of Syracuse. Uh, right now he is right at the top of his form, so please join me in welcoming him, welcoming him to Alabama. Thanks. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I might just stop here before I mess it up. Um, I thought I'd read a piece that's kind of, well, I guess two new ones. This one is uh, a little essay that I have in The New Yorker this week. Uh, time for you know, some serious political ideas now from me. <laughs> it's called My Amendment. As an obscure middle-aged heterosexual short story writer, I'm often asked, George, do you have any feelings about same-sex marriage? <laughs> to which I answer, actually, yes, I do. Like any sane person, 
I'm against same-sex marriage and in favor of a constitutional amendment to ban it. But in truth, I feel that in the interest of moral rigor, it's necessary for us to go a step further, which is why I'd like to propose a supplementary constitutional amendment. Very serious. <clears throat> in the town where I live, I've often observed a phenomenon I've come to think of as samish sex marriage. <laughs> Take, for example, Kay, a male friend of mine of slight build with a ponytail. Kay is married to S, a tall, stocky female with extremely short hair, almost a crew cut. Often, while watching Kay play with his own ponytail as S towers over him, I've wondered, isn't it odd that this somewhat effeminate man should be married to this somewhat masculine woman? Is Kay not, on some level, imperfectly expressing a slight latent desire to be married to a man? And is not S, on some level, imperfectly expressing a slight latent desire to be married to a woman? Then I ask myself, is this really what God had in mind? <laughs> or take the case of L, a female friend with a deep, booming voice. I've often found myself looking askance at her husband, H. Though H is basically pretty masculine, having neither a ponytail nor a tight feminine derriere like K. <laughs> Still, I wonder, H, when you're having marital relations with L, and she calls out your name in that deep, booming, booming nearly male voice, and you continue having marital relations with her, i.e. you are not turned off, <laughs> doesn't this imply that you, H, are in fact still turned on? And doesn't this indicate that on some level, UH have a slight latent desire to make love to a man? Or consider the case of T, a male friend with an extremely small penis. <laughs> we attend the same gym. <clears throat> He's married to O, an average looking woman who knows how to fix cars. I wonder about O. How does she know so much about cars? Is she not, by tolerating this non-car fixing, short penis friend of mine, indicating that on some level she wouldn't mind being married to a woman and is therefore perhaps a tiny bit functionally gay? And what about T? Doesn't the fact that T can stand there in the shower room at our gym confidently toweling off his tiny unit while O is at home changing their spark plugs with alacrity <laughs> indicate that it's only a short stroll down a slippery slope before he's completely happy being the girl in their relationship? from which it's only a small fay hop down the same slope before T is happily married to another man. Perhaps my car mechanic, a handsome Portuguese fellow I shall refer to as Jay. Because my feeling is when God made man and woman, he had something very specific in mind. It goes without saying that he did not want men marrying men or women marrying women, but also what he did not want, in my view, was feminine men marrying masculine women which is why I developed my manly scale of absolute gender. <laughs> Using my scale, which assigns numerical values according to a set of masculine and feminine characteristics, it's now easy to determine how manly a man is and how femme a woman is, and therefore how close to a sameish sex marriage a given marriage is. Here's how it works. Say we determine that a man is an eight on the manly scale, with 10 being the most manly of all, and zero basically a neuter. <laughs> and say we determine that his fiance is a negative six on the manly scale, with a negative 10 being the most femme of all. Now, calculating the difference between the man's rating and the woman's rating, the gender differential, we see that this proposed union is not, in fact, a sameish sex marriage, which I've defined as any marriage for which the gender differential is less than or equal to 10 points. Friends who, whom I have identified as being in sameish sex marriages often ask me, George, given that we've scored poorly, what exactly would you have us do about it? <laughs> well, one solution I propose is divorce. <laughs> divorce followed by remarriage to a more suitable partner. Kay, for example, could marry a voluptuous, high-voiced high NFL cheerleader who would more than offset his tight feminine derriere while his ex-wife S might choose to become involved with the lumberjack with very large arms, thereby neutralizing her thick calves and faint mustache. <laughs> Another, and of course preferable solution, would be to repair <coughs> the existing marriage, converting it from a sameish sex marriage to a healthy, normal marriage. 
by having the feminine man become more masculine and or the masculine woman become more feminine. Often when I propose this, my friends become surly. How dare I, they ask, what business is it of mine? Do I think it's easy to change, change in such a profound way? To which I say, it's not easy to change, but it is possible. I know, because I've done it. When young, I had a tendency to speak too quickly while gesturing too much with my hands. Also, my opinions were unfirm. I was constantly contradicting myself in that fast voice while gesturing like a girl. <laughs> also, I, I cried often. <laughs> Things seemed so sad. <laughs> I, I had long blonde hair and, and liked it. <laughs> my, my hair was layered and fell down across my shoulders. And I admit it, I, I would sometimes slow down when passing a shop window to look at it. To look at my hair. I, I had a strange constant feeling of being happy to be alive. <laughs> this feeling of infinite possibility sometimes caused me to laugh when alone or even on occasion to literally skip down the street <laughs> before pausing in front of a shop window and giving my beautiful hair a cavalier toss. <laughs> to tell the truth, I don't think I would have scored very high on my manly scale if the scale had been invented at that time by me. I suspect I would have scored so femme on the test that I would have been prohibited from marrying my wife, P, the love of my life. And I think that somewhere in my heart, I knew that. I knew I was too femme. So what did I do about it? Did I complain? Did I whine? Did I, did I expect activist judges to step in on my behalf, manipulating the system to accommodate my peculiarity? No, I did not. What I did was I changed. I undertook what I like to think of as a classic American project of self-improvement. I made videos of myself talking and studied these, and in time succeeded in training myself to speak more slowly while almost never moving my hands. Now, if you ever meet me, you'll observe that I always speak in an extremely slow and manly and almost painfully deliberate way, with my hands either driven deep down into my pockets or held stock still at the end of my arms which are bent slightly at the elbows, as if I were ready to respond to the slightest provocation by punching you in the face. <laughs> as for my opinions, they are very firm. I rarely change them. When I feel like skipping, I absolutely do not skip. <laughs> as for my long, beautiful hair, well, I am lucky in that I am rapidly going bald. Every month, when I recalculate my ranking on the manly scale, I find myself becoming more and more manly as my hair gets thinner and my girth increases, <coughs> thickening my once lithe, almost girlish physique, thus ensuring the continued morality and legality of my marriage to pee. <laughs> my point is simply this. If I was able to affect these tremendous positive changes in my life to avoid finding myself in the moral, legal quagmire of a samish sex marriage, why can't K, S, L, H, T, and O do the same? I implore any of my readers who find themselves in a samish sex marriage, change. If you're a feminine man, become more manly. If you're a masculine woman, become more feminine. If you're a woman and are thick-necked or lumbering, or have ever had the slightest feeling of attraction to a man who is somewhat pale and fey, deny these feelings. <laughs> and in the spirit of self-correction, try to become more thin-necked and light-footed. <laughs> While, if you find it helpful, watching videos of naked masculine men to sort of retrain yourself in the proper mode of attraction. If you're a man and upon seeing a thick-waisted athletic young woman walking with a quasi-mannish gait through your local grocery, you imagine yourself in a passionate embrace with her in your car, a car that is parked just outside, <laughs> and which is suddenly in your imagination full of the smell of her fresh young breath, well, stop thinking that. Are you a man or not? I, for one, am sick and tired of this creeping national tendency to let certain types of people take advantage of our national good nature by marrying individu individuals who are essentially of their own gender. If this trend continues, before long, our towns and cities will be full of people like K, S, L, H, T, and O, people asserting their rights by dating, falling in love with, marrying, and spending the rest of their lives with whomever they please. I, for one, am not about to stand by and let that happen. Because then what will we have? A nation ruled by the anarchy of unconstrained desire. A nation of willful human hearts, each lurching this way and that, 
reaching out for whatever it spontaneously desires, trying desperately to find some comforting temporary shred of warmth in a mostly cold world, totally unconcerned about the external form in which that other long-desired heart is embodied. That is not the kind of world in which I wish to live. <laughs> I, for one, intend to become ever more firmly male, enjoying my golden years, while watching P become ever more female, each of us vigilant for any hint of ambiguity in the other. And as our children grow, should they begin to show the slightest hint of some lingering residue of the opposite gender, P and I will lovingly pull them aside and list all the particulars by which we were able to identify their unintentional deficiency. <laughs> then together, we will devise a suitable correction. And in this way, the race will go on. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then the se last thing, second thing I'll read is a, a short story that I haven't ever read before. Uh, there's a lot of voices in it, so I apologize in advance. One, because I won't do them right, and two, because they might be offensive. But we're all friends here. Uh, this is called Bohemians, and it's kind of a, um, a riff on my Chicago childhood a little bit. <clears throat> in a lovely urban coincidence, the last two houses on our block were both occupied by widows who had lost their husbands in Eastern European pogroms. Dad called them the Bohemians. He called anyone white with an accent a Bohemian. Whenever he saw one of the Bohemians, he greeted her by mispronouncing the Czech word for door. <laughs> Neither Bohemian was Czech, but both were polite, so when Dad said door to them, they answered cordially, as if he weren't perennially schlockered. Mrs. Poltoy, the stouter bohemian, had spent the war in a crawl space, splitting a daily potato with five cousins. <laughs> Consequently, she was bitter and claustrophobic and loved food. If you ate something while staying near her, she stared at it going into your mouth. She wore only black. She said the Catholic Church was a jeweled harlot drinking the blood of the poor. <laughs> she said America was a spoiled child, ignorant of grief. When our ball rolled onto her property, she seized it and waddled into her backyard and pitched it into the quarry. <laughs> Mrs. Hoppenlitzky, on the other hand, was thin and joyfully made pipe cleaner animals. <clears throat> when I brought home one of her <coughs> crude dogs in top hats, Mom said, take over your mold hero To her, it will seem like the toy of a king. <laughs> to Mom, the camps, massacres, and railroad sightings of 20 years before were as unreal as covered wagons. When Mrs. H. claimed her family had once owned serfs, Mom's attention wandered. She had a tract house in mind. No way was she getting one. We were renting a remodeled garage behind the Giancarlo's, and Dad was basically drinking up the sporting goods store. His NFL helmets were years out of date. I'd stop by after school and find the store closed and Dad getting sloshed among the fake legs with Benny Delmonico at Prosthetics World. Using the mold of hero, I cast Mrs. H a plastic Lafayette, and she said she'd keep it forever on her sill. Within a week, she'd given it to Elizabeth the raccoon. I didn't mind. Raccoon, an only child like me, had nothing. The Kletz brothers called her raccoon for the bag she had under her eyes from never sleeping. Her parents fought nonstop. They fought over breakfast. They fought in the yard in their underwear. At dusk, they stood on their porch whacking each other with lengths of weather stripping. Raccoon practically had spinal curvature from spending so much time slumped over with misery. When the Kletz brothers called her raccoon, she indulged them by rubbing her hands together fairly. <laughs> the nickname was the most attention she'd ever had. Sometimes she'd wish to be hit by a car so she could come back as a true raccoon and track down the Kletzes and give them rabies. <laughs> Never wish harm on yourself or others, Mrs. H said. You are a lovely child. Her English was flat and clear, almost like ours. Raccoon, you mean, Raccoon said. A lovely raccoon? A lovely child of God, Mrs. H said. Yeah, right, Raccoon said. Tell again about the prince. So Mrs. H told us again how she'd stood wrapped in her yard watching an actual prince powder his birthmark to invisibility. She remembered the smell of burning compost from the fields and men in colorful leggings dragging a gutted boar across a wooden bridge. This was before she was forced to become a human pack animal in the Carpathians, carrying the personal belongings of cruel officers. At night, they chained her to a tree. 
Sometimes they burned her calves with a machine gun barrel for fun, which is why she always wore knee socks. After three years, she'd come home to find her babies in tiny graves. They were, she would say, short-lived but wonderful gifts. She did not now begrudge God for taking them. A falling star is a brief, but isn't one nonetheless glad to have seen it? Her grace made us hate Mrs. Poltoy all the more. What was eating a sixth of a potato every day compared to being chained to a tree? What was being crammed with a bunch of your cousins compared to having your kids killed? The summer I was 10, Raccoon and I, already borderline rejects due to our mutually unraveling households, were joined by Art Siminiak, who had recently made the mistake of inviting the Kletz brothers in for lemonade. There was no lemonade. Instead, there was Art's mom and a sailor from Great Lakes passed out naked across the paper drive stacks on the Siminiak's sun porch. This new three-way friendship consisted of slumping in gangways, playing gloveless catch with a wiffle ball, trailing hopefully behind kids whose homes could be entered without fear of fiasco. Over on Mozart lived Eddie the Vacant, Eddie was 17, huge and simple. He could crush a walnut in his bare hand, but first you had to put it there and tell him to do it. <laughs> Once he'd pinned a vacant sign to his shirt and walked around the neighborhood that way and the name had stuck. Eddie claimed to see birds. Different birds appeared on different days of the week. Also, there was a Halloween bird and a Christmas bird. <laughs> One day, as Eddie hobbled by, we asked what kind of birds he was seeing. Party birds, he said. They got, they got big streamers coming out their butts. You having a party, said Art. You having a homo party? I got to have a birthday party, said Eddie, blinking shyly. Your dad know, Raccoon said. No, he don't yet, said Eddie. His plans for the party were private and illogical. We peppered him with questions, hoping to get him to further embarrass himself himself. The party would be held in his garage. As far as the junk car in there, he would push it out by hand. As far as the oil on the floor, he would soak it up using handy wipes. As far as music, he would play a trumpet. <laughs> what are you going to play the trumpet with, said Art, your asshole? <laughs> no, I'm not going to play it with that, Eddie said. I'm just going to use my lips, okay? As far as girls, there would be girls. He knew many girls from his job managing the Drake Hotel, he said. As far as food, there would be food, including pudding dumplings. You're the manager of the Drake Hotel, Raccoon said. Hey, I know how to get the money for pudding dumplings, Eddie said. Then he rang Mrs. Poltoy's bell and asked for a contribution. She said, for what? He said, for him. <laughs> she said, to what end? He looked at her blankly and asked for a contribution. <laughs> She asked him to leave the porch. He asked for a contribution. <laughs> Somewhere he'd got the idea that when asking for a contribution, one angled to sit on the couch. He started in and she pushed him back with a thick forearm. Down the front steps he went, ringing the iron banister with his massive head. He got up and staggered away, a little blood on his scalp. Learn to leave people be, Holstoy shouted after him. Ten minutes later, Eddie Sr. stood on Paltoy's porch, a hulking, effeminate tailor, too cowed to use his bulk for anything but butting open the jamming door at his shop. Since when has it become the sport to knock unfortunates downstairs, he asked. He was not listening, she said. I tell him no. He tried to come inside. With all respect, he said, it's, not in, my son's, it's in my son's nature to perhaps be not so responsive. Someone so unresponse, keep him indoors, she said. He is big as a man, and I am old lady. Never has Eddie presented a danger to anyone, Eddie Sr. said. I know my rights, she said. Next time I call police. But having been pushed down the stairs, Eddie the vacant couldn't seem to stay away. Off this porch, Poltoy said through the screen when he showed up the next day, offering her an empty cold cream jar for three dollars. <laughs> We're going to have so many snacks, he said. And if I drink an alcohol drink, then watch out, because I ain't allowed. I dance too fast. He was trying the doorknob now, showing how fast he would dance if alcohol was served. <laughs> Please, off this porch, she shouted. Please, off this porch, he shouted back, doubling at the waist in wacky laughter. Poltoy called the cops. Normally, Lieutenant Brucey would have asked Eddie what bird was in effect that day and given him a ride home in his squad. But this was during the one city fiasco. 
To cut graft, cops were being yanked off their regular beats and replaced by cops from other parts of town. A couple of Armenians from South Shore showed up and dragged Eddie off the porch in a club lock so tight he claimed the birds he was seeing were beakless. And I'll give you a beak, Frankenstein, said one of the Armenians, tightening the chokehold. Eddie entered the squad with all the fluidity of a hat rack. Art and Raccoon <coughs> and I ran over to Eddie Sr.'s tailor shop above the marquee, which had sunk to porn. When Eddie Sr. saw us, he stopped his singer by kicking out the plug. From downstairs came a series of erotic moans. Eddie Sr. rushed to the hospital with his purple heart and some photos of Eddie as a grinning, wet-chinned kid on a pony. He found Eddie handcuffed to a bed with an IV drip and a smashed face. Apparently, he'd bitten one of the Armenians. Bail was set at 300. The tailor shop made zilch. Eddie Sr.'s fabrics were a lexicon of yesteryear. Dust coated a bright yellow sign that said, Zippers Repaired in Jiffy. Jail for that kid, I admit, don't make total sense, the judge said. Three months in the Anston, best I can do. The Anston Center for Youth was a red brick former forge, now yarded in barbed wire. After their shifts, the guards held loud hooting orgies kitty corner at Zem's lamplighter. Skinny immigrant women arrived at Zem's in station wagons and emerged hours later adjusting their stockings. From all over Chicago, kids were sent to the Anston, kids who'd only ever been praised for the level of beatings they gave and received and their willingness to carve themselves up. One Anston kid had famously hired another kid to run over his foot. Another is, had killed his mother's lover with a can opener. A third had sliced open his own eyelid with a pop top on a dare. Eddie the Vacant disappeared into the Anston Center in January and came out in March. To welcome him home, Eddie Sr. had the neighborhood kids over. Eddie the Vacant looked so bad, even the Kletzes didn't joke about how bad he looked. His nose was off center and a scald mark ran from ear to chin. When he got too close, his hands shot up. When the cake was served, he dropped his plate shouting, leave a guy alone! Our natural meanness now found a purpose. Led by the Kletzes, we cut through Poltoy's hose, bashed out her basement windows with ball peens, pushed her little shopping cart over the edge of the quarry, and washed it end over end into the former slag ravine. Then it was spring and the quarry got busy. When the noon blast went off, our windows rattled. The three o'clock blast was even bigger. Raccoon and Art and I made a fort from the cardboard shipping containers the Klein frames came in. One day, while pretending the three o'clock blast was atomic, we saw Eddie the Vacant bounding toward our fort through the weeds like some lover in a commercial, only fatter and falling occasionally. <laughs> His trauma had made us kinder toward him. Eddie Art said, you tell your dad where you're at? Eh, no big problem, Eddie said. I, I was gonna leave my dad a note. But did you, said Art. I'll leave him a note when I get back, said Eddie. I can come in with you now. No room, said Raccoon, you're too huge. That a good one, said Eddie, crowding in. Down in the quarry were the sad cats, the slumping watchman's shack, the piles of reddish discarded dynamite wrappings that occasionally rose erratically up the hillside like startled birds. Along the quarry side trail came Mrs. Poltoy, dragging a new shopping cart. Look at that pig, said Raccoon. Eddie, that's the pig that put you away. What did they do to you in there, Ed, said Art. Did they mess with you? No, they didn't, said Eddie. I just say to them, leave a guy alone. I mean, sometime they did, okay? Sometime that one guy said, hey, Eddie, pull your thing. We can watch you. Okay, okay, said Art. At dusk, the three of us would go to Mrs. H's porch. She'd bring out cookies and urge forgiveness. It wasn't Poltoy's fault her heart was small, she told us. She, Mrs. H, had seen a great number of things, and seeing so many things had enlarged her heart. Once she'd seen Goring. Once she'd seen Einstein. Once during the war, she'd seen a whole city block, formerly thick with furriers, bombed black overnight. In the morning, charred bodies had crawled along the street begging for mercy. One such body had grabbed her by the ankle, and she recognized it as Bergen, a friend of her father's. What did you do, said Raccoon. Not important now, said Mrs. H, gulping back tears, looking off into the quarry. Then disaster. Dad got a check for shoulder pads for all six district football teams and trying to work things out with mom, decided to take her on a cruise to Jamaica. Nobody in our neighborhood had ever been on a cruise. Nobody had even been to Wisconsin. <coughs> the disaster was I was staying with Poltoy. 
Ours was a liquor household where you could ask a question over and over in utter sincerity and never get a straight answer. I asked and asked, why her? And was told and told, it will be an adventure. I asked, why not Grammy? I was told, Grammy don't feel well. I asked, why not Hoppin' Litsky? Dad did, did this like snort. Like that's gonna happen, said Mom. Why not, why not, I kept asking. Because shut up, they kept answering. <laughs> so just after Easter, over I went with my little green suitcase. I was a night panicker and occasional bedwetter. I wake drenched and panting. Had they told her? I doubted it. Then I knew they hadn't from the look on her face the first night when I peed myself and woke up screaming. What's this, she said. Pee, I said, <laughs> humiliated beyond any ability to lie. Ah, well, she said, who don't? This also used to be me, pee, pee, pee. I used to dream of a fish who cursed me. <laughs> she changed the sheets gently with no petulance, a new one on me. Often Ma, still half asleep, popped me with the wet sheet, saying when at last I had a wife, she herself could finally get some freaking sleep. Then the bed was ready and Poltoy made a sweeping gesture like, please. I got in. She stayed standing there. You know, she said, I know they say things about me, what I done to that boy. But I had a bad time in the past with a big stupid boy. You don't gotta know. But I did like I did that day for good reason. I was scared at him due to something what happened for real to me. She stood in the half light looking down at her feet. Do you get, she said, do you? Can you get it what I'm saying? I think so, I said. Tell to him, she said. Tell to him sorry, explain about it. Tell your friends also, if you please. You have good brain, that's why I'm saying to you. Something in me rose to this. I'd never heard it before, but I believed it. I had a good brain. I could be trusted to effect a change. Next day was Saturday. She made soup. We played a game using three slivers of soap. We made placemats out of colored strips of paper, and she let me teach her my spelling words. Around noon, the doorbell rang. At the, <coughs> excuse me, at the door stood Mrs. H. Everything okay? She said, poking her head in. Yes, fine, said Poltoy. I did not eat them yet. <laughs> Is everything really fine? Mrs. H said to me. You can say. It's fine, I said. You can say, she said fiercely. Then she gave Poltoy a look that seemed to say, hurt him and you'll deal with me. You silly woman, said Poltoy. You're going now. Mrs. H went. We resumed our spelling. It was tense in a quiet house way. Things ticked. When Poltoy missed a word, she pinched her own hand, but not hard. It was like symbolic pinching. Once when she pinched, she looked at me looking at her and we laughed. Then we were quiet again. That lady, she finally said, she likes to lie. Maybe you don't know. She says she has come from where I come from. Yes, I said. She is lie, she said. She acts so sweet and everything, but she lie. She been born in Skokie. <laughs> yeah, live here all her life in America. Why do you think she talks so good? All week, Poltoy made sausage, noodles, potato pancakes. We ate like pigs. She had tea and cakes ready when I came home from school. At night, if necessary, she dried me off, moved me to her bed, changed the sheets, put me back with never an unkind word. We'll pass, we'll pass, she'd hum. Mom and Dad came home tanned with a sailor cap for me and in a burst of post-vacation honesty confirmed it. Mrs. H was a liar, a liar and a kook. Nothing she said was true. She'd been a cashier at Goldblatt's but had been caught stealing. When caught stealing, she claimed to be with the main office. When a guy from the main office came down, she claimed to be with the FBI. <laughs> then she'd produced a letter from Lady Bird Johnson, <laughs> but in her own handwriting with Johnson spelled J-O-N-S-E-N. <laughs> I told the other kids what I knew, and in time they came to believe it, even the Kletzes. And once we believed it, we couldn't imagine we had seen it all along. Another spring came, once again, birds nested in bushes on the sides of the quarry. The thrown rock excited a thrilling upward explosion. Thin rivers originated in our swampy backyards, and we sailed boats made of flattened shoeboxes, Twinkie wrappers, crimped tinfoil. Raccoon glued together three balsa wood planes and placed on this boat a turd from her dog, Spenguli. And as Spenguli's turd went over a little waterfall and disappeared into the quarry, we cheered. Thank you very much.